my name is Brennan Fisher. I currently work for the World Wildlife Fund, um, and I'm uh, in their conservation science program there. But I also have an adjunct position at the Rubenstein School, and I'm a fellow of the Gund Institute. You could describe most of what my research is, is in the field of poverty and the environment, or um, conservation and development and really it's uh, the, the kind of key point of it all is trying to understand how the state of ecosystems or our management of those ecosystems affects people's livelihoods and this and mainly my focal areas in uh, East Africa and, and uh, Southeast Asia. In the last 50 years WWF has really kind of um, changed its platform. I mean, there's still this focus on um, inc incredibly endangered species around the world, but there's also a big focus on people. And um, there kind of, there isn't any future for conservation of biodiversity without integrating people. The needs of people are very important. Um, and uh, that's kind of where I work right now, is uh, this confluence of trying to understand how to meet the needs of people in a rapidly changing environment, mostly in, in East Africa, as I mentioned, um, while still conserving the ecosystems with incredibly charismatic species and important functioning for um, storing carbon and regulating water and creating soils, etc. My main thrust of my research is part of a, a project in northern coastal Mozambique. And this is a project where WWF and CARE, CARE is a global organization that works on uh, poverty issues around the world and um, very often with a gender focus, working on women in impoverished places. So about five years ago, WWF and CARE came together in Mozambique to try to understand uh, this area called Primeras y Segundas, which is this beautiful coastline of about 200 kilometer stretch with 10 fringing islands, and these islands have beautiful reefs um, and very intact mangrove forests. So really important and amazing place uh, biophysically, but it's also uh, just incredibly impoverished. So in the area we work in, uh, it's about um, two thirds of the people are food insecure. So one third chronically food insecure. So every day they're looking for what their next meal is. So this is an area where the people are intimately reliant on their ecosystems. Everybody there farms and most people fish and if you don't fish there's probably somebody in your household who does and um, if there's nobody in your household who does you're still eating fish at night and so the um, every night so your reliance on well-functioning ecosystems is um, is complete. So a project that uh, Taylor Ricketts and I have at Succinct which is the socio um, Environmental Synthesis Center is to try to use um, really big data sets to try to ask some of the questions that we're asking at the small scale because there are all that data is spatially referenced. We've combined that with data on deforestation, topography, um, the conditions of the coastline, the conditions of the reefs, um, and a whole suite of precipitation, temperature, et cetera, a whole suite of environmental characteristics. So now we have a data set that's huge that has environmental data and um, uh, sociological data of the households, and then we can ask those questions on that big data set, the same kind of questions we're asking at the small scale. Sometimes it's difficult and, and it's hard to always be in the field to collect field scale data, and so we're using this, this big data approach to answer some of the, ask some of the same questions. Well, we've also done things in reverse as well. So some of the work we did uh, for Succinct is um, basically create a map of gender inequality all over the world. And uh, what we're finding there is that, at least for the 50 countries where we have really good spatial data, um, female-headed households have about 15% less asset wealth than male-headed households and about a third of the land available to them for growing crops. And so there's this major inequity across the world and it's, I mean, we've known this between um, male and female headed households and um, these huge gender disparities, but we've been able to produce maps of this for 50 countries or so. And you can see that in some countries it looks the same across the entire country in terms of um, females are discriminated or, or have less access to land and wealth 
evenly across the country, but then there's other countries where female-headed households are doing great. So we're able to look at um, spatial patterns of this inequality across the world, and that has kind of, um, so looking at that at the big data level has uh, made us ask questions at the, at the site scale as well to try to get at gender inequality a little bit better in, in our site scales in Mozambique. And so it's kind of working both ways, this case study and then building up to the larger global data set and vice versa. I, I took a job with the World Wildlife Fund because I wanted to have that a little bit tighter connection to implementation, solutions putting things in on the ground and that's been it's been fantastic to do that one of the things that's really interesting about being able to come back to the Gund Institute and still work for the World Wildlife Fund is that here uh, almost all the all the fellows that I know are doing both things so they are they're not asking science questions for science sake and I think most of the fellows here if they um, collected data did some analysis and produced a paper and that was it I think they'd be pretty upset Almost everyone at Gund is motivated by taking that information and acting on it, taking that information and implementing. So yeah, we're starting to get some uh, decent results in the Primera y Segundas region in northern coastal Mozambique. And so there, this is a, again, this is an area where people rely on both fishing and farming to really meet the needs of the household. Um, and so that's what we've been working on. We've been working with fishermen on trying to um, improve the productivity of their, um, or at least sustain the productivity of their fisheries. And at the same time, in the same villages, working on interventions which um, are put in place to help um, increase yield, increase soil quality. Uh, and so we're trying to work on both sides of the equation there because one of the things that we see is that when a hurricane comes through, or a cyclone as they call it, comes through and destroys all the fishing boats, more forest is, is burnt down and farms expand. When a drought comes through, there are more people out on the reefs fishing. And so they have this really dynamic livelihood where they're just trying to survive. And so some of the work we're doing is trying to understand um, how we can work on both of those at the same time to make them more resilient to change and make the livelihoods more robust to, um, to these kind of shocks. And this has been the space that I've wanted to work in, just kind of poverty, conservation, and the overlap, and trying to understand how, in some places, conservation imp um, imputes a cost onto people, keeps people away, and in other cases, conservation is really the only way for a sustainable livelihood in the future. And so we've been working there and trying to figure out how to make these two pieces come together, conserving ecosystems so that it actually helps um, people survive.